Okay, so the next one I want to talk about is my views on artificial intelligence in terms of how I've been learning to program uh, AI characters in a computer game that I've been making. Okay, so here you can see I've done a very simple um, <laughs> physical model of a enemy robot. It's not a very sophisticated uh, model, but it's not a graphics heavy game. I just wanted something that looked kind of nice and of course, uh, uh, you know, kind of like the movie Tron, you know, very simple polygons and stuff, uh, nice colors. So anyway, this is the robot character. And that beam that you see in front of it is like a sword that it can wave about and attack the player with. Now, I've got a bunch of uh, scripts down here, programming scripts. So if you're not familiar with how video games work, I'll just go over a few little basic things here. So we have the physical model. Uh, we have animations of the model here. We've got animation states. Let's see. It's... Uh, yeah, this is the one. Okay, so I've got uh, run, jump, dash, throw, swipe, reload, recoil, uh, recoil slowly. Uh, now, some of those animation states are actually not used on this robot, uh, but some of them are. Um, that's like a sort of humanoid set of animation states that I've created for all the humanoid robots uh, in my game that are of a, a certain size. And each robot will only use some of those animations. And what you see here with these arrows, they are conditions uh, that determine whether that particular animation is or isn't going to play. So you've got transitions between an idle state, which is where the character is standing still, and you've got uh, a run animation. So if your character is standing still, there will be a condition that says if the character moves at a certain speed, then the animation will, trans will, will, will be transited from the idle state to the run state. And then when you stop running, there's a, an animation transition that goes back to the idle state. And you've got that with all the other ones as well. Okay, so uh, the arms and legs on this model, they move. Uh, let's do a little quick demonstration of the animation stuff. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is a little... I can play some animations here just to... Give you an idea how it works. So we've got an idle state. If I press play, where is it? It's moved to a different position. Yeah, it's for some reason it's moved down. It's because I've got a camera linked to it high up above. So as you can see, it's got like a standing still state. Now it's a top-down game, so that's what the robot would look like when it's standing still. It would animate like that. And if we stop that and we switch it to the jump animation. And we press play. So that's the jump animation. Now, obviously, it looks stupid there because the character isn't actually moving upwards. But when the character jumps, uh, they would move up in the air and the legs would do this at the same time, giving the impression that they bounce themselves up into the air. Let's stop that a second. And then we've got, let's see, uh, a swipe animation for when it swings the sword. Yeah. It's got a nice little graphical effect on it. So we've got these various animations and they are triggered by different conditions. Okay. Now the conditions as to when these um, different animations play one as opposed to the other and how they morph into each other is determined mostly by these, these script objects down here. These are uh, bits of coding uh, that determines how this all works. Okay, now I'm going to switch this up. This shows all of the colliders. Now, all of the stuff that you see surrounding this robot here, these are colliders. These determine how the game decides which objects can and can't move through each other and how uh, the game responds to different objects colliding. So that that is basically the main collider for the actual player model. So if you if your character shoots and hits that collider with a bullet it will register damage uh, that, that then affects the total health amount of that robot and as that accumulates and the robot runs out of health once its health goes below zero i've got a program to kill the robot and create a death noise and stuff like that now that is a solid um collider 
which means it stops robots from moving through other solid objects like walls. It stops it from falling through the floor because there is gravity in this game. And it means bullets aren't just going to pass through it. So that's a solid collider, and that works well. Now, all these other colliders that you see around it, uh, these are detection colliders. That, uh, th these colliders do not stop the robot from going through walls, but these colliders detect um, other collisions with other objects, and then based on those collisions, I, I've programmed the robot to respond in different ways. So, you see the large sphere here? That is a player detector. Uh, that one detects whether a human player in the game um, comes into contact with that sphere. So if a human player crosses over the boundary of this outer circle, then the robot detects that there is a human player nearby, and then there's some programming code that says turn to face that player, um, and then it can shoot at them and shoot accurately. Uh, the inner circle, that detects whether the player is close. So I think I've got a script called player far, which detects the outer distance of the player. If the player gets too close to the robot and it moves into this closer sphere, then the robot will respond with a different bit of programming. And then it can turn to face the player. And once it faces the player, the human player become will, will its detection box will cross over this diamond shaped detection box that will let the robot know that the human player is both close and within sword swipe range okay uh, so at that point the robot is programmed to swipe the sword to attack the player and do damage to them right now all these different detection boxes do different things so we got those ones for the sword swipe we got ones to detect whether a player is close and then the robot can turn to face them, and it can decide whether to move towards them or back away. Uh, sometimes it's programmed to back away. Uh, the robot has two different uh, attack modes. One is the sword. Um, when it's using that, it tries to get close to the player and swipe the sword at them. Um, but sometimes it switches its sword off and uses a grenade attack instead. Now, the grenade attack is triggered by these other big uh, angled boxes here. So this large angled box there and this one going down that way, that's two different distances. If a human player passes within this further box here, uh, if they come into contact with that box, then the robot knows that the player is at a distance where a grenade can be thrown at the, the other player and it can, it, and it needs to throw the grenade a far distance in order to hit the player. If the player comes into contact with the closer box here, then the robot knows that it only needs to throw the grenade a short distance. Now, the reason I've done them at an angle is because sometimes uh, the robot and the player that it's fighting will be on different levels. Like uh, a human player might be standing further down on a lower platform, in which case the robot can throw the grenades so that they go downwards towards the player, or they might throw them at a player who is upwards on a higher platform. Okay, so that's AI stuff. And the long central box that is in the middle here, uh, that tr I think that one triggers the throwing of the grenade. So you've got these two big angled boxes. They detect whether a player has come into range. And then the actual central box here, the long thin one, if the player touches that, then the robot knows that, hey, the player is very, very close and it's time to fire a grenade at them, to throw a grenade. Uh, so the two conditions have to be met. Okay, so you've got these two detection boxes, a small one here and a big one up there. So basically what this does is if, the play if this robot runs up against a large wall that it cannot jump over, then that large wall will cross over the upper detection box and the lower one here. And if it's crossing both of them at the same time, that lets the robot know that it cannot jump over that wall. However, if there's a smaller wall that it can jump over, then that smaller wall will not cross over the higher detection box, but it will cross over this lower one. That means the robot is able to jump over that wall. Okay, so... Keep all that in mind, right? I'm going to show you a little demo of 
a particular level in the game which uses this particular robot. Okay, so I'm going to switch off the music. Uh, and we will go humans versus bots. Now, there's a particular arena that has quite a few of these sword robots. And I think it is this one. Right. So let's play. And you will see some of these sword robots appear. Now, pay attention to how all that that programming stuff that I've just described results in the, the so-called artificial intelligence behavior of the robot. Okay, now the robots will appear on these spawners. Now that's a different robot there. That This one uh, shoots bullets and flames. They've got their own programming that works in a different way. Ah, so you can see one of the sword robots here. He switches back and forth from time to time between sword mode and grenade mode. He can't do both at once. So he's in grenade mode at the moment. Uh, I, I cross over the detection sphere at the front and it automatically throws a grenade. But now he's in sword mode. If I get in front of him, oh, oh, two of them are attacking me with swords. him dead and I collect his grenade. Alright, so as you can see this robot is throwing grenades over at me to get to me. Now it may appear that the robot is being smart and is deliberately using its, its sword when I get close, but it's not. I've actually programmed it to randomly switch between swords and grenades. Okay. An interesting little thing just happened there. Uh, the robot shot and destroyed the health kit that I was trying to get. But it didn't do that on purpose, that was an accident. And this is the point that I'm going to start talking about here as we get into this. Uh, sometimes the robots appear to be do more smart than they actually are. Sometimes they end up doing things that work really well, but are purely an accident that were not programmed that way. So the tank cannon is split into two parts. Um, we've got this part here, which is uh, the cannon... It's the top part of the cannon that swivels independently of the tracks to chase the player. And it's got, as you can see, three big long detection boxes in front of it. And when the player passes into one of those, uh, it knows whether to shoot a short, medium or long range angle of the rocket that it fires. And it gives the false impression that the robot knows how to aim at the player. It's not, it's just three detection boxes, uh, automated detection boxes. And it's quite uncanny when you play in the game. Uh, it often seems like the, these tank robots are like really smart at detecting where you are and firing at just the right time. I also made the detection boxes wide so that as the player passes through the side of one of these, so let's say you're running across from here to here. As you cross into there, it triggers the tank to shoot a rocket, uh, which will likely intercept you as you are making your way across. Whereas if I had these really thin, then it would shoot rockets that would only land behind the player if they're moving. So it gives the false impression that the, the tank knows where the player is going to move next, but it actually doesn't. Okay, so what's the point of all that? The point I want to make, and which I think I've probably written it in a fairly concise summary way here. Complexity does not bring a program closer to consciousness. I think this is quite an important concept a lot of people don't understand. Uh, people who think that robots are becoming sentient when they're not. Um, if I create a simple robot in this program with extremely simple conditions, like it might just have a condition of turn to face the player if the player moves within a certain range, and a condition to fire if the player uh, steps into its immediate shooting um, target box. You could call that an artificial intelligence, uh, but it's not. There's nothing intelligent there. It's just an automated response. 
Now, from what I can tell, virtually all computer programs work in this way. It's just responses to conditions. It's pre-programmed responses to conditions. And there can be variables, like with a toaster, there's a variable of, you know, turn uh, the, the dial that says that I want my toast to pop up sooner rather than later because I want my toast not very brown at all or I want it to be almost burnt. So that's a variable. Yeah? And the toaster itself responds to that variable uh, by making the, the, the toast pop up sooner or later. <clears throat> as far as I can tell, pretty much all programming works in this way, including the AI chatbots. Uh, I hear people say, no, no, you don't understand. It doesn't work that way. It's not just a bunch of if-else statements with variables attached. And I always ask them, explain to me how it's different than that. And they don't have an answer for it. I mean, the AI chatbots, they use the basic same sort of hardware, uh, computer hardware, which is basically gates open, gates closed, noughts and ones, conditions, and so on. A computer never, ever makes a decision of its own. It only does what it's programmed to do, right? Now, what I'm seeing going on in the, the AI debate is that a lot of people think that let's say with these robots in here, um, I'm getting better and better at programming these things. And I'm not saying I'm able to program an AI chatbot, but I'm using this as a base example for you folks to understand the concepts. <clears throat> I've described an extremely basic robot that can turn and shoot at the player, uh, detects the player uh, in accordance with those two conditions. And uh, that's it. That's a very simple one. Now, I've made much more complex ones in here that have a, a wider variety of behaviors. I've got ones that switch between different weapon modes. And when it switches to one weapon mode, suddenly all of its detection boxes and how it responds to the player's presence in certain uh, locations, all that changes. So I can have a robot that has, like, say, four or five fire modes and it will have a separate set of AI behavior for each of those fire modes. Uh, and I can write code that determines when those fi uh, fire modes um, are triggered. Some of the robots have randomized fire modes. Uh, you know, like every five or 10 seconds, they might suddenly switch to a, a, another fire mode. And in other uh, situations, I've got robots who um, will change fire mode according to where the player is. If the player is behind them, uh, they will change fire mode and shoot a rocket backwards. Or if the player is far in front of them, they'll use a long-range weapon. If the player moves in a short uh, distance uh, from the robot, then the robot will switch to like a flamethrower or something like that. I've got robots here that do things like that. And as I've created more robots that have got more complex AI and they respond in more interesting ways, I often get um, these sort of accidental intelligence elements. For example, the, the robot with the sword and the grenades, an accident that I came up with for that, I did not intend to program it this way, I accidentally did it. Sometimes that robot will come up to a wall uh, that it tries to jump over, but it can't quite make it over the top. It can jump up and almost get there, uh, that's because I placed the upper detection box slightly too high, right? That was a, a, a bad bit of programming on my part, a bad bit of design on my part. But what often happens is that if the robot is in a grenade-throwing attack mode and it tries to jump over a wall that is slightly too high and the player is on the other side of that wall, what often happens is the robot will approach the wall, it will jump high enough, almost gets itself over the top, and as it gets to the top, it detects the player on the other side, and when it's in the middle of the air, it throws a grenade over at them. And when I saw it doing this in the battles, I was like, oh, what the hell's going on here? I didn't program it to do that. I didn't program it to jump up and then throw a grenade over the wall, uh, and but it did it. And it happened many, many times in many playthroughs. And it looks really cool, and it gives the impression that the robot knows what it's doing. Because I programmed it, I know that it doesn't know what it's doing. And I think a lot of this stuff goes on. There's been many, many times with the programming of these robots where I've accidentally made it so that the robot does particular tactical things. Um, 
that look very impressive, that make it seem like the art, the AI is more impressive than it actually is. And of course, when those accidents happen, I've often said, you know what, I think I'll leave that in the game. I created a flaw in the AI, but it resulted in a response to the player that appears more intelligent than it is. So I'll leave that flaw in because it works. And um, so that's one aspect of it. And the other is that as I'm creating more of these robots with more complex AI routines, it, it sort of occurred to me that, you know, like on the more advanced robots that I've got here, I might have one robot and it might have, let's say, 20 detection boxes around it. Uh, and depending on which detection box the player encounters or whatever other object goes in, um, collides with those detection boxes, a different little bit of AI will kick in. So I can have 20 detection boxes. I can have 20 different AI responses uh, based upon uh, collisions with those detection boxes. I can also have um, other forms of AI responses that require multiple detection boxes to be triggered at once. So uh, I could have one that says, if, the th if there is a wall to the left of the player and there's a wall to the right, and the player is... Um, is behind the robot then the robot will just run straight down the hall until it reaches an open area and then dive out the way or something like that you know I, it can set all kinds of conditions and like i could take any particular robot and i could keep making its um its detection boxes and its uh its programmed responses more and more and more complex i could have a robot that has 20 different movement modes and 20 different fire modes now whether the computer is able to handle all of that AI for, say, six different robots that are on screen at once. Whether it's able to handle all of that, that's another another issue. Uh, that's a problem. But if I decided to just have one robot be as advanced as possible, I could give it, let's say I gave it a hundred different detection boxes attached to it, and I had a hundred different pieces of artificial intelligence code um, that would respond to all of those detection boxes. You would start to get to a point where it would feel like the robot is conscious and aware and really knows how to play the game. But it doesn't. It's no more conscious than it was before. If I create a robot with four pieces of AI code and four detection boxes, and I create another one with 400 detection boxes and 400 pieces of AI code, so that it's got an endless or seemingly endless variety of different behaviors. The second one will give the impression of something that is like sort of aware. It's a lot more aware of what it's doing, but it's not. It's just me, the programmer. I've just programmed it in a more complex way. And I can have variables in there uh, that respond to the player. For example, if the player keeps attacking from a distance or keeps attacking with a particular weapon, I could have counters on the robot that detect how often it's being attacked by certain projectiles and could detect what range the player keeps moving into. And based upon that, I could have uh, other AI routines that kick in in response. And with doing things like that, you could really give the impression that the robot understands what the human player is doing as responding to it. But again, it's not. It's just automation. Uh, it's just programming and nothing else. The robot is only doing what I programmed it to do, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, with these um, AI chatbots and other forms of artificial intelligence which are advanced, the way I view it is that they are simply more complex. They have more variables to work with, and to cross-reference those variables in order to generate new AI responses. Okay, so just to sum up, the two main points that I wanted to make with all of that is that increasing the complexity of a program does not bring it closer to consciousness. It's still just automation. And unpredicted AI results don't bring a program closer to consciousness either. Okay, so further on from that, um, regarding the AI chatbots, the, uh, which use, what, what do they call them? Uh, something language models. I, I forgot what they call them. The language model-based AI, 
where human language has basically been studied and mathematically calculated. Uh, there, there is a, a, a strong mathematical element uh, to language. And basically, programmers have studied language, the structure of language in mathematical terms, and they've created mathematical programs uh, that make the AI chatbots generate language responses that appear uh, as they would from a human being. I've made previous videos about how false emotion gets injected into the responses to give the impression, to give the false impression of uh, a, an emotional program, which it's not. But I've wrote a key sentence here, that mathematical language models are not consciousness because human thought is not restricted to mathematics or verbal descriptions. So there's, there's this um, issue with academia that's been going on for a long, long time where everything has to be coded either in words or preferably in mathematical terms. So we get statistical analysis done of everything as statistical as mathematical. And scientists try to apply mathematics to everything uh, they try to use it in the study of human behavior. They try to do tests on people regarding the way they think, the way they behave, and they try to come up with mathematical summaries of how we operate, but we don't really operate on that way. This is why academic psychology tends to be very poor. Part of the reason it's very poor. Um, academic psychology tends to ignore things like hypnosis because it doesn't fit in with mathematical models. Uh, but also... Academia is preoccupied with verbal descriptions of things. Things have to be written down uh, with words. And not everything in life is describable in words. There are many aspects of our uh, experience of life, including our dreams, which we just don't have words for. Um, reality is far, far more complex than the words that we use to describe it. And on that basis, so-called artificial intelligence which is restricted to mathematics and the verbal, with it, well, the, uh, the verbal element of human communication is turned into a mathematical uh, model and fed into the computer, because a, a computer can't really do anything other than mathematics. And the AI responses uh, are generated based upon mathematics, but humans don't operate in that way. We are much more advanced than that we have lots and lots of other ways of thinking and behaving that just don't fit in with the mathematical and a lot of it doesn't fit in with the verbal either um, so i think that's a huge restriction and i think a lot of human consciousness falls outside of the mathematical and the verbal as well and that doesn't seem to be something that can be imitated by computers a computer can't get out of the mathematical model as far as i know